Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hope you guys are all doing well. Um, so today's session, uh, Terror on an Ordinary Day, is going to be moderated by uh, Dr. Joan T. Wynn. Um, Dr. Joan T. Wynn is a former high school teacher and associate director of two urban centers, one in Atlanta, Georgia, and one in Miami at FIU, where she was also a professor in educational leadership. She co-designed and directed an urban teacher leadership master's program at Georgia State University, was a leadership and diversity consultant for public schools in Atlanta and Fulton County, Georgia, um, and for corporations and foundations. She also taught at Morehouse College. Uh, designed and directed the Benjamin E. May Scholars Program. Uh, research interests include the, instru in the instruction of urban children, racism, in racism's impact in schools, and grassroots leadership, especially that of Bob Moses and the Algebra Project. She has published research studies in multiple professional journals and books. In 2000, she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Award for work in diversity, and in 2015, received an Urban Affairs Association uh, UAA Sage Marilyn Gittell Activist Scholar Award. Her recent co-authored te co text includes Who Speaks for Justice, Raising Our Voices in the Noise of Hegemony, um, and also Confessions of a White Educator, Stories in Search of Justice and Diversity, as, as well as Quality Education as a Constitutional Right. The work of Lisa Delpit, Asa Hilliard III, Bob Moses, and her brilliant students living on the fringes of society have inspired her writing and research. All those lives, her daughter Catherine and her great big Southern family have taught her how little she knows and more importantly, how to be joyful in the midst of a painful world. Wynn is a retired professor now and a writer educator with the Miami Algebra Project Council. Um, so without further ado, uh, Ms. Ms. Wynn, take it away. Uh, I used to work with the Global Learning I uh, did faculty workshops with them and had a ball, and they're so innovative and they're doing fabulous things. So I, I want to give a, um, a great big thank you to them. And, um, and then uh, uh, a thank you to my husband because I dragged him here. <laughs> and he. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, a shout out to Maria Lovett, who's one of my colleagues and best friends here in Miami, and also to. Uh, Hair salon. He says I say hair salon when I say his name, but I don't. Uh, and he's uh, a PhD student here and uh, it did a lot of work uh, with me when I was uh, before I retired. So, uh, and he's a uh, co-teaching co a class with Maria Lovett now. So, um, it's nice to have little geniuses in the room. Yes. Uh, so the title of my, oh, it was up there, but it's not anymore, but it's called Terror on an Ordinary Day, and it's taken from the headline of an article I read, probably, I can't remember the date of the article, but you'll get a, um, you'll get a chance to uh, read it. It's a very short New York Times article, and it was so uh, pertinent uh, for these, uh, these times, uh, the kinds of things that the Algebra Project, which I work with, um, does and has been doing for over 30 years. So we'll talk about the relevance of that, but I want to let you know that all of my talks are audience participation. So I'm eager to hear your voices and your ideas, and you'll have lots of opportunity to do that. Uh, and in fact, um, I'm going to ask you to do it uh, right now. So, um, and, and I hope you have an agenda so you know. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, again, I've got a big voice, so I'll let you know what we're going to do. But um, I would like for um, you to stand up, to a, up next to a partner. Uh, stand, if, if everybody will stand up right now. And then turn to a partner, whether you know them or not. Hopefully you don't know them. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like for you to introduce yourselves to each other, say your name, and if you're at FIU, just uh, tell the person what your major is. Uh, so if you can do that now. Thank you. Um, okay, now I'm going to ask you uh, to choose a partner A, raise your hand if you are partner A of your twosome. Okay, now raise your hand your left hand if you're partner B. Okay, cool. Everybody knows the right left hand. Woo, cool. Okay, now 
if partner A would read out loud to partner B, those two blue lines which come from civil rights leader Ella Baker. Okay, partner A, will you now read out loud, and it's going to get noisy, so you, but you have it in front of you. Read out loud, We Who Believe in Freedom, those two lines by um, civil rights legend Ella Baker. Okay? Go A. So since our article is about terror on an ordinary day, could partner begin, B begin telling partner A how uh, Ella Baker's words and the feeling of terror uh, relate to each other? So there are no right or wrong answers, just whatever this conjures up in your soul, heart, uh, stomach. Okay? Go, partner B. Okay, partner B, would you finish your sentence that you're in the middle of? And then I'm going to ask partner A to give his or her their opinion about um, that notion of terror and the killing of black boys' sons. I mean, black mother's sons. Okay, go. Okay. Now, it. As the two of you discussed that and those lines from Ella Baker, uh, would any pair be willing to share with all of us uh, what came out of that discussion with you as a pair? Anybody want to tell all of us? I know you do. I'll say Who said? Who said that? You will. Cool. Okay. Can you tell us your name, please? Oh, yeah. My name is Daniela Moore. Daniela Moore. Yeah. Okay. So we basically we talked about um, how she was explaining to me how, like, she has brothers and they don't even, well, basically, like, they'll, okay, let me calm down. Sorry. Okay. So basically, she was explaining to me how not everybody experiences that type of terror that you're talking about, that Ella Baker is talking about in this quote. So I was telling her, like, you know, one day I'm going to have a kid and I'm going to have to, like, explain to them, like, kind of like about the social injustices that we face on a day-to-day -day basis and how like I could be walking down the street and I can get nervous if I see a police and not everybody faces that, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what we were talking about yeah. on that level of it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? I thought you might. <laughs> uh, my partner Daniel um, was getting at something interesting here in Miami about non uh, non black Hispanics and how they kind of have this idea, a type of whiteness in the city of Miami. Um, so they might not really experience exactly what this is saying. And then we also addressed the parallels being drawn. Uh, with the idea of black mother's son and a white mother's son and how that kind of invokes a certain type of emotion um, and gets at kind of like the heart of people, mm -hmm. the difference between saying a black man, a white man, and then saying mm -hmm. a white mother's son. Mm -hmm. Son has a type of feeling that it gets. Right, right, right. There's a relative being able to relate on a different level. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, anybody else want to share? You can use the microphone. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Give yourselves a hand. You did great. I appreciate it. And um, you're, you can have a seat, but you're not finished. <laughs> because I think Connie's going to make sure everybody uh, received a New York Times article that she... Does everyone have a New York Times article in front of them? called Terra on an Ordinary Day. Okay, we got somebody that's going to pass them out for us. Uh, Maria, can you take half to this room, this side of the room? Do you have any more? No, that's it? Okay. Um, and maybe you can share. Yeah, maybe you'll have to share those. Sorry. Yeah. Did y'all get one? Okay. Yeah, there we go.
So uh, is anyone sh uh, uh, shy about reading? Could someone come up to this microphone and read the article out loud as the rest of us read it silently? You have such a strong voice. Would you like to try it? Okay, you're a good woman. She gets an A from any professor that's in here, okay? Let me move this, because oh, this will work too, won't it? Yeah, this will work. Yeah. There we go. Let me spin it towards you. Thank you, darling. All right. So, okay. Philando Castle was shot to death last July on his way home from buying groceries with his girlfriend and her four-year-old daughter. Last week, the Minnesota police officer who killed him was accurate by jury on all counts. I am haunted by how ordinary Mrs. Ca Mr. Castle's final moments were. He was just running errands with his family. It's, the, it's this denial of the right to, be simply, to simply be the, per, the, per, I'm so sorry, the perpetual state of otherness that dangerously shadows black people. This is most obvious in our criminal justice system. 12-year-old 12 12 -year Tamar Rice was playing in a park. How do you say this word? Aki, Akai? Akai Gurley. Akai Gurley was walking down the stairs and having his hair braided for a trip to visit his mother. 15-year-old Jordan Edwards was coming home from a party. All of them were killed by law enforcement officers. But these, death, but these deaths are also point to the border ter terror that black people face while simply going about their daily lives. This problem is not new. Throughout the history of black people have been criminalized for everyday actions that most whites take for granted. After ab the abomination of sa slavery, laws were passed to make it illegal for blacks to travel freely. During Jim Crow, black people could be brutalized for drinking out of the wrong water fountain, sitting in the wrong place, or venturing into the wrong town after sundown. We can see this history in recent deaths of Richard Collins III, who, had, who was stabbed while standing at the bus stop in Maryland. Of the nine <coughs> parish owners who were shot by praying in the South Carolina church, and of Trayvon Martin, who was walking home after buying a bag of Skittles and iced tea. All of them were killed by civilians. Yet black people still struggled to hold on, to hold on the ordinary. A Dallas re resident told a reporter that he keeps, wor he keeps work clothes in his car in case he's stopped by the police. A judge who has been on the bench for nearly 25 years has never left his, city New, his New York City apartment without his judicial credentials, even to buy soda at the store on the corner. In these supposedly more modern times, the right, to the, the right to the ordinary isn't denied just by rogue police officers or racists. However, the problem, has surf the problem also surfaces in the indignity of having to justify oneself against presumptions of wrongdoing and illegal, illegal timacy. A white cashier at a grocery store yelled at my 11-year-old son last summer for walking away with our cart before I had finished paying. Several years ago, a white security guard at the law school where I taught mistook one of my older white male students for me. When I explained to the guard that I was the professor, he responded, pointing to the student, well, he looks like the professor. Some of these quiet, quiet antagonisms cut across multiple identities. My incident with the guard probably also touched on issues of gender and age. Low-income people of color who are stripped of the protect protections of class suffer the, mo suffer the worst ritual harassment. Of course, there is an enormous difference between being killed by the police and having a cashier yell at your child. The incidents are no way in the same. Still, it is easy to overlook the privilege of the ordinary, the ability to, hum to humdrum boring things without fearing, of your fearing for your safety. The problems we face are not only the glaring wrongs of the, cr of the criminal justice system, the structural barriers and pres persistent inequities that shut out our opportunities, but the grinding daily hassles that deny black people the ability to just be. Eli's body is a law professor. Oh, I don't know if you want me to finish reading that, but yeah. Thank you, You're darling. Welcome. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. So now what I'd like for you to do is that you as a pair, your original pair, join with another pair, so there are four of you, and if there are two questions on your agenda under number two, and it, one of the questions is, what two ideas mentioned in the New York Times article seem to be the most compelling to you? 
what two ideas seem to jump off the page as you heard it read or as you look at it? And then the second question is, after reading the article, what democratic values do you think about? So choose the first question uh, first to address, and then we'll talk about the second question. So if you do that in groups of four. Okay, so now I'm going to ask for volunteers to come down here. I know you're willing, right, because you've been so good so far. Uh, and just kind of share, maybe a couple of you from each group uh, could come down and share what your group, uh, you know, just some uh, high points. <laughs> just a couple of sentences, you don't have to tell everything, but just a couple of sentences that might sum up your discussion, because some of you were having some very yeasty discussions that I really enjoyed uh, eavesdropping on. Um, so. No, y'all have to. Would one of y'all come down and talk about it? Oh, or talk about it from where you are if you're, oh, you're coming? Great. You want to come? Anybody from over here? Cool. Come on down. <coughs> oh, well, here's fine. You know, just so you can, everybody can see you because you'll be talking to them. Yeah. So just kind of turn around and Talk to the audience. Oh, great, 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 great. Anybody else want to come down? Daniel, come on down. Cool, cool. Okay, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm just going to start from this space here. Ah, oh, Daniel. <laughs> so uh, take a breath, and then if you will turn and face this whole audience back on both sides, and if you need the mic, feel free to come up here if that's easier for you, or just speak from there. But just turn so everybody can hear your voice. Okay. In regards to the two questions, or two ideas that were mentioned that were the most compelling, one of the things I wrote down was the fact that a black judge could feel unsafe. A title that if it was given to a white male, which it often, you know, there's plenty of white judges, it's uh, considered noble and respectable. It's a high position in the social hierarchy, and he could feel the fact that he could feel unsafe on the roads. The, the fact that he has to bring with him wear clothes, just so that in case he got stopped, he could justify who he is, or that he's not a criminal, or things of that nature. The other thing I wrote was the fact that uh, something that Harrison pointed out that was alarming was that how many of the people that fell victim to this was children, how many children have been killed due to discrimination. And the uh, democratic values that, that came to mind was equality and discrimination against uh, race, sex, and age, sometimes all three combined, and also socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Would you introduce yourself and tell us what you thought? I'm sorry, Lane. Can, can I use sure. your sheet? Sure. And, and do you mind turning and facing the audience? Gotcha. Thank you. Hello. Hey. I'm sorry, Lane Presme. Uh, but we're on the democratic values, right? No, either one. What were the compelling ideas or democratic values? Either one. Yeah. You choose. I was with my group over there, and we discussed that the the, the p perpetual state of otherness was compelling, you know, as a concept of like, you know, always needing some justification for wh whatever you're doing, or wherever you are, you know. And I thought about in terms of the democratic values, I thought about due process of law, which is which is like, you know, if you get that, it's kind of like you you got lucky, mm -hmm. you know. You hit the lottery. You, you you made it far enough to enjoy your due process. Now let's see how you do with that due process. Mm -hmm. That was my that was my you know. That's what resonated with me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Y'all will turn around and face. We're all here. <laughs> cool. That's great. I'm Talia. <laughs> Sarah. Mario. 
and Melanie. So basically we're talking about one of the high points of our discussion was when we were referring back to our own home countries um, and how racism is seemed as being more prevalent here in the United States and mistaking that as, um, or seeing that as there being less racism in our home countries when in reality, um, in here the voices are stronger. So there is more being able to speak out for the injustices that you see Whereas in our home countries, they're like the minorities are more hushed. So while it seemed as more peaceful, there's actually more unrest underneath that layer of silence. Pretty much. Anybody else from the group oh, um, add something? I guess. Oh, about that. Well, no, um, about anything <laughs> about your discussion. Yeah. Well, um, one of the democratic values that we were talking about was that there was a lack of freedom. There was a lack of, lack of education and <clears throat> care for um, certain minorities, in this case specifically the black community in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we talked about is imagine to be fearful of just simply walking in the street in your own neighborhood. And sometimes we don't notice that because we may not live in that neighborhood. So you have to think about putting yourself in the shoes of that person. My name's Tracy. We were in a group together. Yeah. Um, one thing that like stood out for us was the same as Daniel, um, the judge, with the judge like having to bring his credentials just to book at the grocery store, um, just based on his color. Um, and it related to me, uh, dem democratic value was. Um, we live in a country where we talk about like the land of the free, but we really aren't. Like when we try to do like freedom of expression or speech, um, we get criticized or like, um, yeah, just criticized or just like disciplined for our freedom of expression. We also talked about how in this country we value cooperation and working together, um, but how we can't really cooperate and work together if we don't know one another. And so we were thinking about how often, like, you know, just these lists of names and how many of us are familiar with their stories and how many of us are familiar with their experiences and how can we take care of each other if we don't know each other. And last but not least, Hi, my name is Gary. Um, my group and I were discussing um, that one of the most basic principles that we believe in or that we'd like to believe in in this country is the right to a fair trial. And so many of these police killings are totally extrajudicial. We have officers acting uh, impulsively, uh, in panic, and they become judge, jury, and executioner before any evidence can be discussed. Thank you. Gary. Okay, thank you all so very much. Very insightful, your comments. I appreciate that. So, um, I have another exercise, and uh, before we start it, I'm going to read to you um, a uh, free verse that I um, experimented with. And um, I felt, because I, w I was born in a segregated South uh, in the days of Jim Crow laws, which dominated the South for over 50 years, where black people did not have the same rights as white people in the South. And so these issues really uh, speak to the roots of my life uh, personally, professionally, collectively. And so uh, I tried to put that down on uh, paper. And, um, and after I read um, Terror on, on an Ordinary Day, I felt um, more committed to um, sharing it with people. And uh, so I'm going to read this, and then I'm, I'm going to have a little panel of folks who are going to give us some, uh, some of their thoughts about uh, 
uh, how this relates to our overall theme of this session. Uh, and, and the name of it is called Born White in the South, uh, My Schizophrenic Self. I am Southern to the bone. I am she who sucks juice from honeysuckle's center, whose eyes pop out when wisteria breaks into purple passion, who tears up at the sight of Spanish moss wrapping wide-trunked oaks, who waits weeks to watch the azaleas wake up in spring, who loves dancing on cracked red clay and ogling the spectacle of lightning bugs, and who savors the land where sunny days abound even in December. I am southern to the bone. I am she who craves creamy cheese grits on cold days and hot days and all days, who dives into deep dish cornbread until her belly shouts, who slops sorghum syrup on mile high biscuits, who smacks fried chicken and collard greens and blames her sister for all that smacking noise, who sips sweet tea cold no matter the season, and nips bourbon and honey for healing reasons. I am southern to the bone. I am she who loves people who say y'all, and honey child, and sweetie pie, and especially those who know how to draw a good bless your heart. I am southern to the bone. I am she who wears polka dotted dresses when long pants would do just fine and smears on red lipstick when others go, oh, natural. Who proclaims a prompt, hey, how are you, to strangers sauntering down the street, who offers refreshments no matter what time you show up at her home retreat, who grew up with neighbors checking in on her, those who spill out, don't you know, sweet Caroline has a new bow as they join her swinging on the front porch. Who, like all good neighbors, delivers cherry pies, cream cheese pound cake, macaroni and cheese, and muscadine wine whenever illness, accidents, or deaths befall. Who also knows when to serve up mimosas and milk punch for special celebrations. Who devours Flannery O'Connor, William Faulkner, Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Eudora Welty, Tennessee Williams, Pat Conroy, and yes, indeed, Shakespeare. But who learns metaphor when her uncle, staring at the sky, predicts it's going to be a cob floater. Yes, I am southern to the bone. I am she whose ancestral blood is drenched in Jim Crow laws in miscegenation that split hearts apart, in lynchings with picnics and postcards, in white citizens' councils torching churches, mutilating black bodies, crafting burning crosses, in aristocrats' demonic diatribes, pitting poor white against poor black, all the while preaching our Negroes are happy, they know their place. In Southern senators vomiting vitriol of segregation, racism, and poisoned public policy. In silent liberals scared to stand up against the killing machine, running from integrated schools into suburbs swearing, I'm not racist, it's an economic thing. Yes, I'm rooted in that Southerner, too. I am Southern to the bone. I am she whose forefathers scream into the wind. Redeem our souls. Dig out of denial of our gory, brutal history, our failed memory. Own that history. Don't justify it. They shriek, shaking my bedpost. Own it so the bones of our scorched, bloody hands can heal. Own it and repair it. Give back what we stole. Own it 
no reconciliation without truth. I am Southern to the bone. I am she whose ancient mother screech in the dark. Tell it, so hellish clanking chains hooked on human flesh, neck to neck, wrist to wrist, cease resounding in our skulls. Tell it, so thousands of feet sounds pounding the earth, trudging 80 years from Virginia through Georgia to Louisiana, forced investment capital. Stop crushing the promise of our eternal sleep. Tell it, for our jawbones shatter from your claims of innocence while standing your ground on mass graves of the enslaved. Bankers collateral damage in Alabama, Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and of course Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, Wall Street, and Georgetown. Then your town and my town tell it, oh yes, so the nation concedes its complicity in the crime, the violence, the betrayal, the genocide, the promiscuous profit from buying and selling black bodies, stealing native lands, greasing its economic engine, make the nation face the nation. Own it, share it, and end it so our bones stop rattling and the ghost of our spirits can at last rest. For you and I, Miss Honeysuckle Vine, are Southern to the bone. So, uh, <laughs> so I, have, I have copies for the volunteers and what we do and I think we have enough time to do it, is that uh, with global, the Global Learning Initiative, we have what we call a Socratic circle. So we have, um, and we only had six chairs, so if six of you would just come in here and sit in a circle and talk to each other, and nobody else is allowed to talk, just you, will talk about anything about that piece that struck you in some way and you'll just talk about it. And then we're gonna have six people sit right here who will just be observers and will watch and take notes. And then they'll speak after you speak. Does that make sense? You think so? Okay, good. So do I have six <coughs> wonderful volunteers? Because we had a, yes, great. Still come now this will be just a conversation amongst you, so don't worry about out there or me. I'm going to sit down and be quiet. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Need one more person? Do I have one more person? Yay, okay. Good, good, good. And uh, again, there are no right or wrong answers. It's just what bubbles up in your mind. And, um, and if you'll speak that to each other. Uh, and then now, do I have six observers? Can I have six observers to just observe and take notes on their conversation? Do you read any of the notes? Pardon? Do you read any of the notes? Oh, okay. Well, just <laughs> jot down a bullet point, you know, like uh, something like a word that will trigger your memory of what they said. Yeah, come on. You got the hang of it. Come on down. Yeah, so they don't have to be formal notes. No, no, no. They can just be bullet points. Yeah. Great. Super. Uh, one or two others? You two want to try to be part of this? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so y'all can sit there, and all you're going to do, you're not going to talk to each other or to them. You're just going to take, uh, listen very intently to what they say. And, and, and how they process with each other, okay? Okay, so the question is, 
what did y'all find um, uh, compelling or interesting or you hated it, uh, a particular line or, you, you know, from that? Yeah, oh, let me give you a copy in case you need to refer back to it. Sorry about that. It's on front and back, so. Again, Connie was nice enough to run these off for us. Whoops. Does anybody have one now? No, you don't. Okay, uh, begin.
like for instance, like I was telling with my group, I was like, it's real when you think, like I can talk amongst my friends and stuff, we're all black and stuff, and we'll say things like, oh, like I wanna walk through a nice looking neighborhood with big houses, cause I just wanna walk through it, look at these beautiful homes and stuff, and actually dream, I wanna be a dreamer. That's a part of a democratic body, you know, the pursuit of happiness. But it's like that dream gets taken away when you start to say like, oh, you know you can't go there, you know you can't walk through there. Like, what you mean? Stop playing. If we walk through there, everybody's gonna be outside, looking out their windows, trying to see who are these little black kids walking through their neighborhood. And we say the same things when we're trying to drive through the neighborhood. They're gonna be like, oh, look at this car, this basic looking car, who could this be? Or it's very, like just to that whole simple fact that you can't even, do the simple things like it says in the article that most whites take for granted is real. You know, I don't know if a lot of people really understand the whole complexity of this issue, unless you're black American or you're Caribbean American who's been here for like about a year. I'm, I'm gonna say it only takes a year plus to really encounter that type of, that type of, um, yeah, discrimination. So I just like the fact that she puts it in the, um, the poem that she is accounting for. She's one of the people in that um, line of history that's accounting for it because she's also being hunted by those that are enslaved. <clears throat> We're being hunted too, us black kids. We're being hunted by our own ancestors. We hear from our grandmother, grandfather. We hear from aunts and uncles, how we constantly have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And it's like the, oh, you know this, or you should know that this is how it's gonna be and this is how it is. And I like the whole fact of millennials now are not trying to take it, you know? It's not gonna be as simple as, we're not gonna try to conform to it, you know? We're gonna try to do as much as we can, yeah, to just get past it. Because what we truly want is to just live. And I've seen like white supremacists having the little rally and stuff, and they say stuff like, oh, you can't take our America, but who said we were trying to? We already been here, this is our America, all of ours, not just white men's, you know? So it's like, the fact that they think we're trying to take something that, one, is not theirs, and they're being very violent about it and stuff, and we've been trying to do the peaceful protests, the non-violence, the <coughs> slave narratives, we got all these books, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison, everything that uncovers all this type of history, and it's like, you're still like a wall towards it. No one's trying to take it. We're just trying to live easily. And it's, it can also be said about more than just black people, you know, like Caribbean people, Hispanic people. We're just all trying to live without feeling like we can't. Because honestly, it's like the American dream is like a false reality. You know, you're being sold it and stuff when you're like, oh yeah, we gotta go over there. Gotta go to America that gotta have a lot of opportunity and stuff. But when you come here, you really see the true reality of it all. There is no real opportunity gotta look a certain way, you gotta act a certain way, you gotta have certain credentials for this opportunity that you so want. And it rings true to me, cause like, my people couldn't just go to another country. You can't just be like, oh, we can go over there cause it's better opportunities. We already here, and we see that there's no opportunities. And other people are coming in, and they're thinking there's gonna be opportunities, and it's like, it's a very harsh reality when they're being shown that you too have to work very hard to get just half as far as you truly want it, you know? Do you ever wish that, that you would like to warn them before they got here, hey, listen, this is how it's gonna be? Yeah, I'll say it as simple, as simple as I can. I'd be like, okay, you know, cause like whoever mentioned it was the non-black Hispanics. It's true, they really do have an air, like they can, um, Superiority. Yeah, 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 because they can look more Caucasian and it's really all a look. Because once you surpass Miami, once you get out of like South Florida, let's say, and you go to Tallahassee and they hear the accent, it's so they find out, oh, they hate me too. So yeah, it's <laughs> like, it's so like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't act like I'm better than this. Yeah, and that's what I say. And I'm, it's like, yeah. I come to FIU and I see this community and I love it. I love to see, like, this is a nice community over here. Hispanic people, you guys are doing it big because like we as black people, we don't have that. We don't have no big black community. We don't have no, oh, that's a nice home over there full of black people. We gotta move to another community. Yeah, and they, when we they move, bomb Tulsa. That's yeah, right. whitewashing, gentrification, all of that stuff starts right, happening and then next thing you know, the community goes from being good to just <laughs> falling down and it's like this systematic thing that we 
to try to fight, but it's systematic. It's bigger than just the individual. All right. Can I can I introduce an idea here? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> what, like, if we're really going to talk about, you know, this exorcism of, of these ghosts that, that can't seem to rest, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like who are these ghosts hunting, first of all? You know? Who are they hunting? And to, to fix this, if we're really going to confront the problem, right? at what cost is it no longer worth it to fix this problem? Because we'd have to undo a lot of good things that are working well for the nation and might compromise the national security, the national well-being, just to rectify things over here, even though we're at this global stage now, where we have to compete globally as a, as a national force, right? It might not, it might be that we cannot afford the investment that it would take to undo all of these injustices and that we're too far gone. That's why. I'm going to, ooh, go ahead. Last statement. We need to start bottoms up and we need to make our local, our state, and our federal government accountable for the actions that they take. Because they're not going to is we need to start to focus and say, okay, who are we going to make accountable and how are we going to tell them that you're accountable and come voting for We're not going to listen to your last 90-day rhetoric or speech. We're going to write down all the things that happened in the last few years, months, years, and say, you're accountable, you're out. Right. But, That's a but wonderful you, thought to end on. I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'm so sorry because this is so rich. Uh, what you've said, and w let's give them a great big hand, please. <laughs> yes, darling. Mm -hmm. Great reminder. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I allowed us to go over time because y'all were so good, but I know I'm supposed to stop at 1.30. So thank you. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for the very insightful remarks. Produced by Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.